welcome to our first workshop. Uh, I am pleased to welcome Juan Pablo Bernal, uh, a professor uh, at the Autonomous University of Mexico, uh, who is an expert in geochronology, and he runs a uranium thorium laboratory, uh, first one in Latin America, and he is also expert in trace elements and other techniques. His main interest uh, is uh, our changes in late places. Place to see. So, thank you very much. Thank you. And the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for all the organizers for inviting me. Uh, this talk, I'm going to be uh, telling you, it's a continuation of what uh, Kathleen uh, uh, just uh, uh, discussed about. And she actually went ahead of me and asked for a raise of hands who, who has done any uranium coding dating. So not many of you have done any uranium coding dating, but now you have the basic principles of, of the dating, and now we're gonna get more into how do you work with your data, how do you obtain your data, how do you work with your data uh, in a more practical sense. So uh, you can copy this QR code uh, in, in your phones. There's a link to a, a Google Docs uh, file. Uh, sorry, a Google Docs folder that will have several papers that are kind of basic papers that, that uh, I'm going to be discussing and two or three screenshots with data that I'm going to be showing you. So uh, if you all have it, uh, otherwise I can just send you the link uh, 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 later on. Okay, so what are we going to be discussing is how, how we measure uranium-238, 234, and uh, thorium-230. How we actually uh, do to calculate an age. What is the detrital correction? Kathleen, uh, uh, Kathy went uh, through a little bit of detail of how, do we, uh, um, how, do, uh, how to do it. We're gonna get into a little bit more details. Uh -huh. That's something that, if you're working with the in science, and something with uranium dating, it's basically something you cannot get around with it, so you might as well understand it as best as possible. And then we're going to be building some age models, uh, which is also really, really good. This is basically an essential part of your work that usually, not, all, not always, but usually, it's left in, uh, in the supplemental material of your paper. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's very little discussion of it. So. A lot of it is uh, uh, it's coming from what I've learned from 20 years of doing uranium thorium dating. Uh, that sometimes it's difficult to understand the papers to, uh, because papers have to be very condensed. So I've tried to put it on a more uh, easy way to, uh, to understand it. So let's start with see uh, with uh, how we measure uranium isotopes and thorium. Truth is, is that measuring uranium decays isotopes is not easy. Why is not easy? Despite of what we, uh, if you go to a lab and they put it just straightforward, it's not easy because uranium is not very abundant. Uranium, uh, if you have a stalagmite with one ppm of uranium, which is a reasonably rich, uh, uranium rich stalagmite, it's actually, you only have this micromole of uranium 238. 238. But if it's already in secular equilibrium, meaning that it has as much thorium-230 as it can actually have, you can actually make the calculations and see that you have around this concentration of uh, thorium-230. So this is starting to be very, very low. So this is around uh, 154 PPT parts per trillion of uh, thorium-230. That amounts to approximately 242 billion atoms of thorium-230, which you'd say, yeah, it's a lot. But if you consider that the most efficient detection methods that we have so far only detect approximately 3% of the amount of material that we uh, um, introduce, you are left with only 7 billion atoms of thorium-230, which might sound a lot, it's not, but uh, it's enough right now to, uh, to, uh, to measure. 
and this is on the mode on, under ideal conditions. If you have, let's say, 50 ppbs of uranium in your samples, divide this by 50, if, uh, by 20, and if your sample is a Holocene sample, then divide this by uh, for divide it by 10. So the amount of thorium 230 it becomes less and less and less that you, you can measure. So basically, you need either a lot of sample or a very sensitive method. Historically, it was measured by what is called counting methods, alpha, spectro uh, alpha spectroscopy. So alpha spectroscopy, Kathleen, uh, uh, Kathleen uh, gave you a little introduction. It's a method that is actually counting the alpha decays, uh, alpha decay events of uranium-238, uranium-234, and thorium-230. Mm -hmm. For that, you need, uh, I mean, it, it basically relies on the radioactivity of these, iso uh, of, uh, of, of these isotopes. And uranium-238, even though it's a radioactive element, it's not very radioactive. Uranium-234, it's also radioactive. It's, it's more radioactive than uranium 238, but also not very radioactive. So sensitivity in this in this uh, in these methods are it's a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, what you do is you dissolve your sample, and you just one way or another you just put it on a aluminium plate, it either electrodeposited, or you can absorb it into manganese oxide. But it has to be a very thin layer, and has to be that there are many aspects uh, it, it to be considered. And then you, you have a counting instrument. This is a count, uh, school, uh, well, um, do it yourself, it's called uh, alpha, spectrometer, alpha Spectrometer. This is a little bit more professional one from Orte. These counting instruments are still used for other purposes. Not much anymore for uranium dating. But usually you leave your sample counting for one week, something like that, to have enough counts. Uh, for, uh, for, for uranium. So if you have to date uh, 25 samples for, for your stalagmite, just start to add up. There's a further problem with, the, uh, uh, with that. Sample size you need in the ideal conditions between 1 and 10 grams, and that's just for measuring uranium 238. Counting times are, 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 are long. And then there's another issue. Uh, Sensitivity is not related to the uh, to the relative abundance of the isotopes, but rather to how radioactive they are. So you can see here, this is an, uh, an alpha spectrum of uranium-238 and uranium-234. They are fairly similar uh, in sensitiv sensitivity-wise. Problem is that once uh, the counting statistics are considered, uh, they are very similar, and therefore. Uh, property called error correlations become very, very important. I'll show you a little bit later what the error correlations uh, are. So this is uh, how things used to be dated in the 60s, in the, de in the 70s. Um, there's a, a nice picture of Henry Schwartz. I couldn't get a hold of it. Henry Schwartz was one of the first uh, persons uh, uh, um, dating stalagmites. And there's this stalagmite with a big hole in it that was basically just uh, scraped out. They were probably taking about 30, 40 grams of, of calcite just to get one day. So uh, because of this, this method is pretty much uh, no longer used for what we are interested in. Now we're working with mass spectrometry. For those of you just coming into the field, uh, you soon realize that mass spectrometry is a workhorse of speedithium research. So we use mass spectrometers for uh, dating, we use mass spectrometers for oxygen, carbon isotopes, or uranium isotopes, or calcium isotopes, or whatever isotopes you're measuring. And we also use the dating uh, mass spectrometer for, for trace element analysis, for laser ablation. So it's basically, you will, you will be working with a large variety of uh, mass spectrometers. So basically, a mass spectrometer is an instrument that allows the separation and quantification of ions as a function of their mass charge ratio. Basically means that there must be a way that you have to ionize uranium or thorium or whatever element that, that you're interested in, sometimes even molecule, and 
you analyze uh, and you separate those ions based on the mass to charge uh, ratio. Uh, you, you have your sample and your sample uh, basically has to be introduced into an ion source. Uh -huh. That ion source might be or not uh, within a vacuum cha chamber. The rest of the instrument is a, a really high vacuum. You have, uh, after the ion source, you have a system that focuses the ion beam and shapes the ion beam for, uh, and then puts it into a mass discriminator, which is usually a magnet, mm -hmm. or could also be a, a, a quadruple. And then you have a detector system. A detector system is something that is going to give you a digital signal uh, proportional to all the uh, uh, to the amount of ions reaching that detector, and could be a Faraday cut, channel cross, secondary electron multipliers, dailies, drop plane. Mm -hmm. The ones that we're going to be working, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to be talking about mostly are either thermal ionization or inductively coupled plasma as ion sources. Mm -hmm. uh, Mostly today, are, uh, most uranium dates are obtained uh, with, uh, with ICP uh, MS, and I'm going to tell you why in, in a minute. Uh, even so, that you can measure 238, 234, and 230 with a quarter pole. Magnetic sectors are more sensitive and have lots of other uh, advantages, and with all these uh, uh, detectors. So, what is a thermal ionization mass spectrometer? A thermal ionization mass spectrometer is you do your chemistry, Kathleen showed you a little bit about, uh, about the chemistry, and um, you put a little drop of your sample, mm -hmm. of, your uran of, your, of the uranium that you have purified, and you put it in a filament, a tungsten filament or a rhenium filament. You put that filament in a vacuum cham uh, chamber, in the mass spectrometer, and then you heat this, you put, you put a current through it, and it's just basically like an old wall. That, that used to have exactly the same principle, and basically what happens is evaporates, hits another uh, another heated uh, filament that uh, that ionizes, ma makes an ion cloud, and this ion cloud there's a set of extraction lenses, there's a magnetic fields that are just pulling the ions into the mass spectrometer, and the magnet is actually separating uh, 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 the, the ions. Mm -hmm. And usually you get the lighter ions have what is called less momentum, less uh, amount of uh, yeah l l less energy, so they are easier to to detour uh -huh, to change to change directions. While heavy uh, heavy ions uh, are more uh, have more momentum and therefore more difficult to detour, and therefore you can separate high uh, heavy from like. Uh, and this is usually what you get, these very, very nice top, uh, flat top peaks. Uh, this is a mass scan for uranium 238, 236, 235, and 234. This is, of course, obtained from a, from a brochure from one of the uh, flyers. I think this is uh, from new. Mm -hmm. So it, it looks uh, really nice. The advantage of thermal ionization mass spectrometry is, first of all, it was the first uh, method to actually uh, uh, count the the isotopes based on their real abundance and not the, the radioactivity. Uh, yeah, uh, it's very precise. To, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to the, the results are, are are very precise. It's very sensitive. The signal to, to noise ratio is, is very large and has a very clean mass spectrum. And this is very important uh, because. There lies one of the uh, limitations of multi-collector uh, ICTMs. It, it, it comes with a little bit of problems. One of them is that there is what is called differential ionization efficiency. Because you are hitting the, uh, the isotopes here, basically there's a distillation process going on here. And it's actually fractionating that. And that distillation process going on here, that also happens uh, uh, with oxygen isotopes, with, uh, is uh, modulated by the Rayleigh, by the Rayleigh e e equation that we'll discuss, that we'll, you'll discuss uh, la later, but it's also time dependent, dependent on, the, uh, uh, on, the, on the analysis. And there's another very big problem. Not all elements ionize very well. For example, ionizing thorium is really difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, 
when we were working with United Foreign Dating, uh, when I was doing my PhD and they were doing some uh, things uh, dating, uh, basically out of 20 samples, one or two would fail because uh, thorium will not, uh, will not, uh, one of the samples, because you have to hit the sample a lot, sometimes the filament just breaks and because it's vacuum, it's gone, you cannot do anything. So that's a little bit of a problem. Uh, no, thorium is not the only one. There are some other elements that are difficult to, uh, to ionize. But also because it's difficult to ionize, sensitivity for these elements is not the best. It's good. It's really good. Uh -huh. it, it's enough. Uh, uh -huh. but, it, uh, but it's not really the best. We th uh, compared to uh, alpha spectrometry, you can get away with one gram, half gram of sample. Uh, and you'll get very decent pages. These are the sort of more modern instruments that you uh, that you will find: the thermal uh, finning and uh, the triton thermal ionization mass spectrometer. In here, you'll have the ionization chamber, the uh, the extraction lenses, the magnet, and the the detectors and the amplifiers part of the mass spectrometer. This is from new. Uh -huh. Similar, uh, very similar, different, uh, different geometry. Uh, the the current instrument will differ a little bit on their geometry, how much they are actually dispersing. Uh, they're differing on the ion optics, how efficient they, uh, they are. They are also differing on how they're moving the, the detectors per, over, overall. The principle is pretty much uh, the same for each uh, for each one of the of, of, of the instruments. And now we have the current uh, method uh, that is actually used, which is inductively couplet plasma mass spectrometry. Here, uh, the main difference is that we have a very efficient ion source, uh -huh, which is an argon plasma. An argon plasma is basically formed when the argon is flown into a, within a, a radio frequency field, uh -huh, around 40 kilohertz, and there's a spark just uh, ionizing uh, the argon. And these ions will stay here in this uh, radio frequency uh, field. Once we flow more argon into, into this, there will be a chain reaction of ionization, and then we can have a plasma. Mm -hmm. A plasma which are basically composed of ionized argon uh, elements, Ar argon ions, sorry. And then what happens when we put an aerosol of the sample, we, we, we will analyze the sample one way or another. I'll show you uh, that there are several ways to, to create an aerosol of the, of, of the sample. That aerosol is the sample dissolved, uh, basically of the sample dissolved, uh, dissolved. We have your uranium, your thorium, probably, and you could also have lots of water molecules. So the first thing that happens is this plasma is very hot. Around the base of the plasma could be up to 8,000 Kelvin, which is extremely hot. So as soon as the aerosol reaches, uh, get, gets close uh, to it, it'll evaporate. Mm -hmm. and the water will evaporate, and all the particles, oxides, and salts of your elements will will remain. Then these are decomposed, uh, atomized, and then ionized again, uh, and then then these are extracted into the mass spectrometer. This is happening at atmospheric pressure, so there's air surrounding this plasma, and this is to 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 8, eight uh, uh, torrs. So, and this is happening within one or two centimeters. So, there's a very, very, very big change in, in pressure between here and here. So, the ions start to expand, and that leads to some fractionation of the ions. Uh, going. Why are we using an argon plasma to, uh, to make the ions? Argon has a very high ionization pos uh, uh, potential, uh, about a little bit above 1500 kilojoules per mole. Uh, above that, there's only helium and neon, all, uh, and, and, flu and fluorine. All the other elements uh -huh, have a ionization potential which is lower than argon. So that basically means that argon, when, uh, when, the, uh, uh, when the elements are in presence of argon ions, the argon will ionize them. Argon will take an, uh, uh, um, 
and an outer electron uh, out of them of pretty much all the elements in the uh, in the periodic table. This is the ionization efficiency for all the elements. Most elements ionize uh, that, are, that are introduced to the plasma. Most elements are ionized around yeah sometimes 100%. Uh, some elements are not very effective but are still uh, are still ionized depending on their ionization uh, potential. So the plasma turns out to be a very efficient ion source. Um, the mass bias, there's no fra the, even for that, there's some fractionation of the of the isotopes. It's constant. It doesn't. Uh, it's not. Uh, it's not time dependent during the analysis. In contrast to things. Uh, and the other advantage is because the plasma is at atmospheric pressure, you can actually couple to different uh, sample introduction systems like gas chromatography, like laser ablation systems, like uh, liquid chrom uh, chromatography. <coughs> but also, because the plasma is at atmospheric pressure, and, it's, uh, and there's nitrogen, oxygen, CO2 nearby the plasma, and actually uh, uh, diffusing into the plasma, the potential for some complex and uh, uh, molecular interferences is there, and that's something that we need to deal with when, we, uh, when working with, uh, with, uh, with ICPs. There are currently two instruments uh, uh, that are widely used. One of them is the Thermal Finnegan Neptune ICPMS. Uh -huh. widely available in many laboratories, and this is the new Plasma 3 ATPMS. There are previous versions of these instruments. Uh, there, there, uh, you could find uh, in some other labs the BG54 or the GB Isopro or the Plasma 2 or the Plasma 1 and, uh, from, uh, from, from new. You, you will also find newer instruments uh, that are coming into market from the last few years, uh, the Neoma and uh, the Sapphire. Uh, which have a, what is called a collision cell. I'm not going to get into the details of, uh, of that. But as you can see, they are basically uh, similar to the, uh, to the teams, except for two things. They, uh, both plasmas have first what is called an electric sector analyzer. And what the vendors will tell you is, oh, they'll basically homogenize the energy of the ion beam. And I've struggled for many years to actually understand what they actually meant by, uh, by that. What it actually means is that because you are introducing a whole bunch of elements, the ESA, what it's going to do is just going to, is going to limit the mass range of elements that you're going to be focusing into the, mass, into the magnet. Mm -hmm. That's something that you don't have to do in the thermal ionization mass spectrometer. Why? Because it's in vacuum. It's everything uh, as clean as possible, not in here. So you need this ESA to get rid of all uh, uh, all ions that are uh, outside the mass uh, wind, uh, mass range that you are uh, that you are interested. Other than that, they have the same detector capabilities. Uh, they have the same uh, the same uh, magnets. It's pretty much the same electronics. And one of the things that we that we find here uh, we. Uh, we with multi-collector uh, plasmas is that because they have a very efficient ionization, uh, ion source, they are way more sensitive than thermal ionization instruments, and therefore it uh, enhances uh, the precision very well. So a little comparison between teams and multi-collector ICTMS. In teams, you can work only between 50 and 20 samples per carousel. Once you run from your 15, 20 samples, you have to take it out, put another carousel, and leave it in vacuum overnight, and then start uh, running again uh, in the morning. Thorium, as all the high ionization potential elements, are very difficult to, uh, to measure. Mm -hmm. So the low ionization efficiency leads to very low count, count rates, and therefore poor uranium thorium, uh, thorium uranium uh, statistics. So you basically can get away and get good data with three or four nanograms of uranium, with salt per mil uranium-234 me uh, measurements. And very important, uranium and thorium are, are measured separately. And why is that important? And why is that? Because uranium 
uh, is volatilized at very at reasonably low temperatures and floating at very high temperatures. So you can run your sample at, let's say, 12,000, uh, 12, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 1,200 uh, degrees, and you analyze for uranium, and then you can probably, uh, if your samples, if your uranium and thorium are the same, then you can run it up to 600, 1,600 uh, uh, degrees, and then you analyze uh, for thorium, and that works very really well. multi collector recipe PMSs, uh, basically, because you don't have to be changing the carousel, you can run and run and run and run samples with an auto sampler uh, pretty much uh, forever, and you just keep on feeding the auto sampler to get, uh, to get the ages. Thorium is as sensitive as, uran uh, as, as uranium, so that helps a lot with the statistics. You can, good, you can get very good ages with only two to three nanograms of uranium, so you just have to start to visualize how little, how many, the small amount of, uh, of ions that we are actually uh, uh, detecting, just two or three nanograms of uranium. It's just basically peanuts. Uh -huh. And still get a really, really nice precision in your, uh, in, in, in your uh, bench. But, of course, you want to keep your instrument running. You need to have lots of argon bottles to, uh, to keep the plasma uh, and a lot of acids and water. So they have some, their pros and their cons. So a small comparison. Um, this is the uh, the half life. Uh, this this data is from the uh, from uh, different papers. I'm comparing the uranium two thirty four two thirty eight values at secular equilibrium. Uh, from which the half-lives were uh, deducted. Uh, and basically, these three measurements were obtained uh, with alpha spectrometry. So you see, in the most ideal conditions, these, uh, these are the precisions that you obtain. Can not be connected to any true uh, measured uh, with things very, very precise, 234, 238 in uranonites, and got a hold on, on and proposed this half-life. <coughs> So you can see a significant reduction in the uncertainty, but his half-life was never really <coughs> taken into consideration because it had some other issues uh, going on. Nevertheless, Hai Chang in 2000, and, uh, uh, yeah, 2000, uh, made this uh, well made these measure measurements of 234 to 38 in, in sacred equilibrium, and this is the isotope composition that he reports for uh, sacred equilibrium. And then he repeated this, uh, a similar exercise with more measurements, with, but with multi-correct CPMS. And you can see the reduction in, in uncertainty, like really, really nice. This is also for 230, 238 sacred equilibrium. You can see uh, Chang et al. 2000. This is the best value that he can report. And 2013, 13 years later, with multi-correct CPMS. It's just one, uh, one per mil, from triple mil to one per mil. This is using teams, and this is using multi collector recipients. A more uh, direct approach to what we're doing with Salagmax, this is a paper from POSI uh, 2019, and they have this Salagmax that was initially dated with, by teams and later on was dated with multi collector recipients. So there's a mixture. Of, of multi-collector and teams uh, uh, data. Hmm? The multi-collector ages are red, the multi-collector CPMS ages are in red, and the teams ages are in black. Immediately you see that there's a little bit of a change. This is the age model for that static map. Uh -huh. And immediately you can tell that there's a, there's a change, uh, th there's a difference between teams and multi-collector CPMS. Why I like this example? Because they were uh, run in the same lab, two different instruments, a stalagmite with the same amount of uranium following exactly the same uh, chemical uh, 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 procedures. So I'm plotting in this axis the relative uncertainty uh, age, relative to, uh, uncertainty relative to the age. And you can immediately see that 
the team's ages have around 8% of uncertainty in this stalagmite, while the multi collector are, uh, are always three uh, around 3.5% of uncertainty. So this is a really nice example why multi collector ICPMS is now widely used for uranium for uranium for dating. Teams ages are still good, they are still bad it's not that they are not valid, but it's way easier and more precise to get them using multi collector ICPMS. Now, before jumping to the analysis, there are two things that need to be taken in co uh, into consideration uh, for uranium for the analysis of uranium and thorium acids. One of them is the addition of the tracer for isotope dilution analysis, and the other thing is the separation and purification of uranium. So, how do we actually um, how do we actually quantify uranium and thorium isotopes? We actually weigh them. How we actually do it? How how would we manage to weigh something so tiny as a few? picograms or femtograms of sodium using mass spectrometry and isotope dilution. What is isotope dilution? The isotope dilution is basically uh, an analytical methodology uh, where we are adding, gravimetrically adding an internal standard with an isotopic composition which is different from the sample and is extremely well characterized. Uh, so what we need is something that has the same chemical and instrumental behavior as uranium, and, as the natural uh, isotope of uranium and thorium, but they are not them. This spike, uh, this tracer will also allow us to see if there is some um, uranium and thorium loss uh, uh, during the sample preparation, and we can actually control, uh, uh, control for that. Uh, and basically, it allows us to make a very, very high precision gravimetric analysis of these uh, uh, isotopes. For this, we need high purity thorium 229 and high purity uranium 233, or a mixture of uranium 233 and uranium 236. As Kathleen said this, uh, this morning, these are synthetic, these are radioactive, these are way more radioactive than the normal. Uh, uh, a natural uranium uh, isotope, so you have to be careful with them. I'll tell you a little bit later, later about it. These are the, uh, when I mean that they are extremely well, well characterized, uh, they have to come with a, some kind of certificate like this. These are the certificates for the spikes that I have for thorium 229 from Oak Ridge National Lab. It has to give you a little bit of a, uh, an idea of how many uranium of, of the thorium isotopes present and the abundance. For the 233 uh, spike that, uh, that we have, it has to give us also an idea that it's mostly uranium, to th uh, mostly uranium 233, it's 98.02%, with the uncertainties pretty well char uh, characterized. The, uh, the isotope ratios uh, uh, that, that are uh, required, mm -hmm. uh, that, that are uh, certified. So what we do, we are actually mixing two isotopically uh, distant uh, end members. So one of the things that I'm gonna be talking here a lot, here, is mixing lines. So, raise a hand, you, any one of you knows what a mixing line is? Okay, yeah, very few. I highly recommend you to have a very basic geochemistry course, because it'll help you a lot to understand the, uh, uh, what's happening here. And mixing line is basically the result of mixing two different things and, uh, and at, di at different proportions. So for example, this is gonna be different. Uh, who had coffee this morning? Everybody had coffee this morning, most people. Who had, who had sugar in them? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you had how many sugars? Two, one. I should say three now. Three. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so basically, thank you very much. Appreciate your help. <laughs> so basically, what they, this had is a mixture of pure coffee and sugar at different proportions, and you can have, uh, and, and if you put them together, not mix them, but if you put them together, you have the equivalent of a mixing line between coffee and sugar. 
So it's kind of similar thing here. We're mixing a very pure thorium spike. This is uh, a 229 spike with, the, with our sample. And we're getting uh, a spike sample. So, uh, 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 yes, we're getting a, 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 a mixture of our spike with the sample and different, uh, and because we have the spike at a very well known uh, concentration, we can actually uh, know how much of this mixture belongs to the spike and how much of no. this mixture for, uh, belong, uh, belongs to the samples. Uh, the advantage of thorium 229 is that it will follow exactly the same chemistry as thorium 230. So if we lose a little bit because it it got stick to the walls of the container or whatever, we're going to be losing thorium-230 at the same proportion of thorium-229. Uh, because we're mixing them together, if there's a loose, uh, if there's a drop that is accidentally lost during the analysis, they will, we will be losing 229 and 230 at the same proportion. So that will actually help us to uh, have a control of, uh, uh, of how much thorium is actually analyzed. And they have very similar, not identical, but very similar behavior in the mass spectrometer. So it's just a matter of disentangle this uh, this composition. And for that, we are using a mixing equation of, iso of isotopes uh, 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 with different isotope composition. Uh, Faure, in the basic geochemistry book from 1997, put it very nicely. It's here, this is the equation, uh, which is a, be uh, as a function of the amount of sample, amount of the weight of the spike, the weight of the sample, the atomic weight of the sample and the atomic weight of the spike, are, these are different because uh, uranium-233 has a different atomic weight than, uranium uh, than natural uranium. The abundances of different of, of the isotopes, uh, the ratio that we are measuring, mm -hmm. and the abundances of, uh, of, of each isotope uh, in the sample. So uh, there's a book, uh, Shoe, 1997, Quantity of your chemistry, which has a really nice example. Uh -huh. You can have it uh, here. Uh, using the same equation, we know the uranium concentration of the, uh, uh, in the spike. We know the abundance of uranium 233. We know the abundance of uranium 238 in the spike. We know the, the atomic weight of the spike. We know the uranium 233 in, in our sample is zero, not close to zero, it's zero. There is no uranium 233 in our sample. We know uh, the abundance of uranium-238. We know the weight of the, uh, the atomic weight of the sample. We know the weight of the spike because we are doing that gravimetrically. We know how much sample we, we, uh, we, uh, we weighted. And just doing some, uh, some maths, we can actually obtain a concentration of uranium, a very precise concentration of uranium. And we can do the same for thorium. And then we can... Uh, 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 ratio the, uh, the concentration. One advantage of this is that this is very precise. You can uh, apply some other methods that are, uh -huh, uh, that are uh, uh, that, that might be available that are used in other techniques. But but because we're measuring ratios here, this is extremely more precise measurement than measuring the the, the absolute abundances uh, of, of, of each isotope, and therefore. These will come with an uncertainty of lower than 1%, sometimes even lower than 0.1%. So these are very, very, very precise measurements. The other important thing is that uh, you need to separate uranium and thorium. You need to purify uranium and thorium. And this is extremely important uh, for two things. One of them is that you cannot just dissolve the sample and put it into the mass spectrometer, uh, into the multicolator. Why? Because it's uh, uh, because we are introducing everything that is in, in solution. So if we introduce a lot of ions into the uh, into the plasma, they will ionize. They will go into the um, into the mass spectrometer, into the what is called the ion optics. But they're going to cause something called ion spa uh, charge space effect. So because it's going to be there's going to be a lot more ions. Because you're going to have your, all your calcium, all your strontium, all uh, um, yeah, uh, yes, calcium, strontium, magnesium, everything that is in, in sample. It's going to cause 
uh, what is called space charge effects, and it's actually going to affect the fractionation of the isotopes and it's going to affect your measurements. So we actually need to separate uranium and thorium. And separate uranium and thorium is it's easy, but it's a little bit, it takes a little bit of work. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, uh, we make sure that the samples and the standards were, that we're using are exactly in the same uh, matrix. It also helps help us to remove uh, potential interferences that we that we uh, might have. It also allows to pre-concentrate the sample. If the sample is dissolved in 10 milliliters of acid, we can probably just have it in one or two milliliters. So that increases the concentration and therefore increases the uh, the, sample, the counting of statistics. Mm -hmm. And it basically includes a dissolution step, and then sometimes, not all the time, sometimes there's a co-precipitation. So basically what we do is we add some iron into the, into the dissolved uh, sample, and then we add a little bit of ammonia, mm -hmm. and that actually precipitates the iron, of, uh, iron hydroxide, and the iron hydroxide will suck all the uranium and thorium, like really, really, all the uranium and thorium will stick into the iron uh, oxide, like really quantitatively, it's re really nice. Then this is dissolved, uh, we dissolve, and using ion chromatography with uh, different kinds of, uh, of resins, we actually separate, uh, we can just get rid of the excess of iron, and then we can get separate uranium and thorium following a procedure uh, uh, like this. So one of the things that I need to tell you is that sometimes when you go to a lab, mm -hmm. you'll say, oh, you just follow this, uh, this procedure and, and they, uh, as they say, and talk to your uncle. Mm -hmm. The thing is, someone spent a fair bit of time actually getting uranium and thorium separation. And this is how they actually look, uh, the cali uh, these calibration curves. This is from my lab, this is from, uh, from another paper, basically, uh, uh, you need to know exactly when uranium is being uh, coming up from the ion chromatography uh, columns and when the thorium is being uh, eluted and when other, other potential other elements that are potential interference are, are being separated. Mm -hmm. So there's a fair bit of work beha um, be, uh, to getting the, the, all this uh, prepared. So now we have uranium and thorium separated, we have already put it through the mass spectrometer, and boom, you got your data. Mm -hmm. How do we get from this to here? And this is going to take us a good part of the next hour. You have your data, and you have uranium and thorium concentrations. You, uh, you, when you're looking at your data, you want as much uranium as possible and as little thorium-232 uh, possible. Why? I'll tell you in a, se in a, in a second. They're going to give you a thorium-232 or uranium-238-232. Uh, depends on the lab. They're probably going to give it to you either in activity ratios or in isotope ratios. You have to make sure what is your lab actually, what is the lab actually reporting. Uh -huh. the, the, the highest of these ratios the better because it means lower the trital thorium to thin. And I'll show you why in a second. These are the activity ratios that are going to be used for age calculations. But these activity ratios are, uh, are gonna just going to give you the first approximation of your age, not the real age. Why? Because this age has to be corrected for the trital con uh, contributions. So you get. Uh, some uh, some results of the uh, isotope compositions correct for the trial uh, contributions and the actual ages or the, uh, the the ages of your of your sample. So we're going to go through all this table uh, through the concepts of this table uh, with a mo little bit more detail in a second. And I think you can have this table is in the in the link that I sent you. Mm -hmm. So now you have this. I'm going to show you a little bit of the ages of, of these uh, equations. There are three solutions to the uranium-238 uh, decay series. These three solutions are essentially the same. They're just uh, basically a, a change in the algebra, algebra. This is the, uh, the first equation that was originally used in the, by Wally, by Wally Bro I mean Broker. Uh, 
by Eric Handy in the 60s and 70s and the, uh, a little bit in, during the 80s. It's based uh, on 230, 230, 230 against Uranium 234 and 234, 238. Mm -hmm. These are the K constants. There is a second equation. Kathleen mentioned that it is the Edwards equation. That it is basically 230, 230 Uranium 238 and the delta Uranium 238, uh, Uranium 234, sorry. And a very similar equation, which basically converts the delta 234 into, uh, into activity ratio. Very, very, very important. Yes. If you try to solve this equation for the age, you're going to be spending the next 75 years. Uh -huh. <laughs> you cannot solve this equation uh, uh, for age. Why? Because you have age here in the age in uh, time in this part of the equation and in this part of the equation and basically there is no way to actually solve to get a function of time as a function of isotopic composition. So what do you do? Either these are the graphical solutions of the uh, of each uh, of each equation and I'm sorry it used to look better in my computer but this is 230 234 against 234 238 this is 230, 238 against delta uranium 234, and this is 230, 234 against 230, uh, 238 against 234, 238. Mm -hmm. So, in theory, the, uh, well, all the isotope compositions should, uh, if you have one of my isotope compositions that solves this equation, then you should be able to, to get exactly the same result for this age. So, what you can do is you just put your activity constant uh, ratios in this plot and it'll give you an idea of how old or how young your your sample is so it'll give you it'll tell you oh i have this uh, this composition yeah this is somewhere around 75,000 years old mm -hmm. but we i mean yeah it'll give you an idea it'll, uh -huh, but it's not really what we really want so to actually solve the equation we need to have uh, this, uh, the isotope compositions that we measure, and we have to solve this equation by iterating uh, different times until we, uh, until we can solve this uh, equality. Mm -hmm. And basically, that's the way most, uh, uh, that, 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 that's the only way to, to solve it, by iteration. Just Basically, by kind of guessing, uh, by by guessing which age is going to allow us, which age number is going to allow us to solve uh, this um, this uh, equality, mm -hmm. uh, and using this the k constants, mm -hmm. and basically that's that's the way to do it. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure that this doesn't uh, give you more light. How we actually do it? There are several softwares to, uh, to do it. You can actually do it in Excel. You can do it. Uh, you can write software. But there are two main options uh -huh, to actually get the ages. Two, two softwares that are very, 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 very easy to work with. One of them is Isoplot, and the other one is Isoplot R. Isoplot used to uh, was developed in the 80s and 90s by Ken Ludwig. He used to work first at the U.S. Geological Survey and then at Berkeley Geological uh, Center. He was a very, very good at programming and uh, and getting all the codes to solve uh, geological equations uh, in Excel in a graphical way. The mm -hmm. uh, problem is is that cannot be retired, and not only that, but uh, Microsoft stopped uh, allowing to run. Uh, it, stopped, uh, it does not allow to run any more Visual Basic scripts in, in Excel. So it's, you have to work in Isoplot, which you can still get. I'll show you in a minute where. Uh, in a uh, 2003 version or earlier. Sorry, 2013 version or, or earlier. So it's becoming more and more difficult to actually run it because I tried to run it, uh, some examples for, for this talk. And it's getting more incompatible with current versions of, of, of Windows. 
and you can run it on a Mac. If that's your, that's your. But it's the first software that is actually provided a graphical in, uh, interface to actually calculate uh, in the edge. And included most of your chronological systems. Uh -huh. And it allowed for the creation of the tritone material. It was very transparent, very flexible, really, really nice piece of, uh, piece of work. And what it, you could get plots, what I call R2P plots, which are ready to publish, are like really nice plots. And if you look at the de uh, uh, papers, you know, your chronological papers from the 90s, from the 2000s, series, from the last up to 2015, something like that, you would, uh, you would see plots that they are just basically came out in, in papers, just the plots that came out from, from isotopes, like really, really nice plots that you could work with. But because here yeah, isoplot was, is getting more and more difficult to run, Peter Birmish from University College in London uh, wrote, wrote an R-based code based on isoplot, but it's a different code from, uh, for, from isoplot. And it has most of your canonical functions, not all of them. And very importantly, is web-based. So, uh, so I'll show you in a second uh, how, does it, uh, how does it work. This is the isoplot. This is where you can get isoplots from Virtual Economical Center. Just a piece of advice. If you Google, if you Google isoplot, don't go for the first link because there's another new plugin so software that uh, that uh, is nothing to do with, uh, with this version of Python. So in Isoplot, you had your Excel spreadsheet and this set of options that were coming with uh, visual basic macros and things like that. And you have this window. This, this was the main window from, um, uh, from Isoplot from which you could get all these isotopic systems, uh -huh. uranium lead, argon argon, rubidium and strontium, it was really, 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 uh, really complete. So, and you can get this very nice uh, uh, uranium, uh, uh, uranium thorium uh, evolution uh, uh, diagrams, like extremely good uh, plots. I mean, this is definitely ready for, uh, for a publication. You could get a good detrital, uh, the detrital corrections, particularly because some of the, the methods for detrital corrections were also developed by Ken Ludwig, who really, really got into the math of the, of the corrections. And I'll show you in a second why you really need some, a good software to do it. Because something, <laughs> it's something that you, it's difficult to, uh, to do it by hand. Not impossible, but time consuming. Isoplot R, on the other hand, is this. Uh, you, you can find it here in this uh, 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 web address, and this is the interface that you are uh, that you come here and uh, that, that, that you work that you start working. And I'll show you in a second how does it work. There are several mirrors in different in different parts of the world, which is good uh -huh, uh, for most things. Uh, there's one in Austin, one in California, one in London, one in Europe, one in South America, one in India, one in China, and no, sorry, two in China, and one in, I think it's actually three in China. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have mirrors in several, in, in several places, and that's really good because it, it, it's very reliable that if one server is down, you can work in, in, in other software. Sometimes you find that the version in London has uh, more capabilities and diversion in Austin or diversion in South America. Why? Because sometimes it takes some time for these systems to be updated. But other than that, are pretty much identical. So this is how it looked like. You have, once you go into the, into the interface, you have your data. So, uh, you, you have always an example data. Here you can choose your chronological system that you're going to be working. Uh, the different options, and there are always options. Uh, you have we're gonna go into these options with a little bit of time because they will listen to details, really. Mm -hmm. And there's help, and this help is actually really nice because it'll tell you exactly what, uh, what at least from my perspective, exactly what, what uh, uh, the questions that you might be having of uh, should I click here, or should I click here? It's just, it's really really helpful. So for uranium series, mm -hmm. uh, this is how it actually looks. 
you, uh, this is a simplified uh, notation, but it's actually asking you for the 238 to 238 activity ratio and its uncertainty, the 234 to 38 activity ratio and its uncertainty, and the, sorry, and the 230 to 38 uh, and its uncertainty, and then what is called the error correlations. Error correlations uh, for the most part of, uh, of the work that you're going to be doing can be considered zero. And I'll show you in a second, uh, once I show you an isochrome, what the error correlations are on my look. So this is data that you will always uh, find, uh, you, you can al already find in uh, one of the Excel files that, uh, that uh, I put in this link that I sh show you. Mm -hmm. So then you have these methods, you can go to, evolu uh, you can have an evolution diagram which uh, is the one uh, which is something like this. You can actually make isochrons, and I'll show you in a second what an isochron is, or you just can calculate ages. And because that's what you're interested in, you just calculate the ages. So you go to the details, to the options, and this is very, very important uh, for, for you to understand what you're working with. First, the input format. There are many ways to actually put, uh, put your data, and you have to be very careful that, you, that your data is in this format. Labs usually sometimes report isotope ratios, sometimes they, uh, they report 234 to 38 in activity ratios, sometimes they report it in delta values, mm -hmm. sometimes they report 238 to 32. Uh, isotope ratio, sometimes they report 238 to 232 in activity ratio. So you have to be absolutely certain of what kind of data is, your, is the lab reporting. Mm -hmm. And you put the data in the way the software is actually. Uh, uh, <coughs> it's also asking you for the, uh, the input errors. This is a discussion that is never going to be ending between different brands of. Uh, mass spectrometrist, whether you want to work with one standard error or two standard errors, uh -huh. whether it's more correct to, to work with one or two, your uncertainties look better if you're working with one standard error. They're more realistic if you're working with two standard errors, so you have to be careful uh, with that. And also the output errors, whether you're going to be working with one standard error, two standard errors, or a uh, confidence uh, interval. So we're going to go through these details, make sure your data match the input format. This is particularly important uh, uh -huh, uh, for this, and this also includes the uncertainties. May, uh, may, uh, make sure you, have to, you correct that. This is the different, uh, so, so actually some labs actually also report the uncertainties as a percent level. So you, you have to make sure that you're not introducing a 0.1% uh, uh, error, which might be a very good error, and put it here because point, uh, and put it as uh, as an error on activity ratios because a point one activity ratio uncertainty is rather large. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have to be very uh, you have to be sure on on putting your your data. The output errors again. I highly recommend you. I'm, uh, highly recommend you to work always at the same uncertainty level, uh, uh, two sigma level. So I would recommend you to work on, on two standard errors. But that again, uh, it depends uh, upon upon yourself to decide. What it is extremely important is that you you be consistent. If you're going to be working with one standard error uncertainties, you have to be always working with one. Uh, what's it on? You don't change it uh, uh, in, your, in your data uh, analysis. And if you go to ages, this is actually uh, data from one of my students, Salak uh, uh, Mike from, from, from Guatemala. You just, uh, you are not doing any, temp, any detrital correction just yet. You just click run, and in a matter of second, boom. You have your ages. Mm -hmm. You have your ages, and these are these ages are in kilo years, with their uh, corresponding uncertainty, and you have the initial 34 to 38, which Kathleen showed you, talked to you 
earlier, which might or might not be uh, uh, relevant. Mm -hmm. If initial to 34 to, uh, to 38 the uncertainty, and the covariance between H and 234 to 38. I'm not really gonna uh, get into this uh, into the meaning of this. The important thing is that now you uh, uh, now you have time. Uh, you, you have your initial ages, but these ages are still not binding. So you have a lot of work, but they have to be corrected. Why they have to be corrected? Because of thorium. And why because of thorium? Uh, because thorium is elastic. Mm -hmm. You need to do the the, the, the trital correction. Mm -hmm. So back to this table. Uh -huh. In this table. Thorium 232 is non-zero. It rarely, it never is zero. There's always some thorium 232. And if there's some thorium 232, it basically means that there were the geochemical conditions to mobilize thorium, whatever the isotopic number, whatever the, the atomic mass, sorry. So basically means that if there's thorium 232 being introduced into your sample, there has to be some thorium 232 getting into your sample as well. And the geochemical conditions were, uh, were set for at least some mobilization of thorium. Uh -huh. So you have to bear uh, that into, into consideration. So that basically means that for most stalagmite samples and for most uranium thorium, da uranium -thorium dating, if you're going to be da dating some coral, this is also the case. At T0, thorium-230 is not zero. There's a tiny little bit or a significant part. Where? How much? We don't know. We really don't know, and we need to find out. Because otherwise, the ages that we are reporting are just basically meaningless. Mm -hmm. what, what is the effect of having more thorium-230? Uh, is that basically the, the samples are older than uh, the, the ages that we are obtaining are older than they should than they should be. So basically, what ha what's happening? This is the thorium-230 that we're measuring. Part of it, a little tiny of it, is coming from thorium-229. And we can actually subtract it uh, uh, quite nicely. So this is the thorium-230 that is present in the sample. But from this, I cannot, I cannot tell how much was formed rad radiogenically in situ and how much was incorporated. Was this? Uh, this much, and so how much was formed in situ? How much is the trifle? Where do I draw the uh, where do I draw the line here or here? There is actually no way to actually know it just by lo by, by looking at thorium thirty. But if we look at thorium two thirty, uh, if, if we know that thorium two thirty two was mobilized too with thorium two thirty at a constant uh, at a reasonably constant ratio, we can actually use thorium two thirty two as an index for thorium-230 trital. And we can assume uh, that this ratio will be constant uh, throughout the stalagmite growth. This is not a new problem. This is something that has been working from the 70s, uh, from the 1970s, from the 1980s, uh, up to a few years ago. This is, this is actually being studied quite, uh, quite significantly. And I think you'll find most of these papers um, on the, on the folder that I have in, uh, in the mixture. So they can form what is, what is called uh, the, uh, a mixing line. Mm -hmm. And this mixing line will allow us to determine either the most likely isotopic composition of the detrital material that we can correct our samples, or estimate the composition of the detrital, detritus free sample, mm -hmm. or sometimes even both. How we do it? We need to have two or more samples that are coeval, basically mean uh, that they're around the same age, uh -huh, that precipitated with different proportions of the trash material. Uh -huh. And we also need to know, uh, make sure that the detrital material is not changing. The, the isotopic composition of the detrital material remains constant. And very, very important that all of them behave, uh, all the samples behave in a closed system basically mean that there are no loss of uranium or no gains of uranium once the system crystallizes. Because otherwise, so there are different types of isochrons. 
two, uh, two dimensional two dimensional isochrons, which are um, very good to obtain the isotopic composition of the vitro material, sometimes of the optogenic material. I'll show you some examples. And there's 3D isochrons from Ken Ludwig and Peter Anton. Uh, and basically, will give us the isotopic composition of the detritus free uh, Of the two new iso isochrons, there are two types Rosholtite and Osmontite. Rosholtite are those that are normalized against thorium 232, and Osmontite are those that are normalized against uranium 238. Then, there are two types of, of Rosholt this one and these two, these, and these two types of ozonites. So I'm not going to go into detail from, uh, 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 much of them. All of them are mixed in lines, and they are just differing on the way how we're applying the isotopic compositions. But all of them are a mix in line between autogenic and radiogenic end members. Autogenic uh, end member and a detrital end member. They are exactly uh, the, the, the same principle. Uh, in the Russell isotopes, basically the slope of the, iso of the isochron is the isotopic composition. Uh, if you are plotting 230-232 against 234-232, the IEA slope will be 230-234, and we can calculate the slope from the, from the, from, from the isochron uh, with a normal regression, with many of the regression methods. Uh -huh, I'll show you in a second. And we can actually calculate 234-238 for the autogenic phase from the 234, 238, 238, 238, 238 to 234. These are all normalized against 232. Um, <coughs> and then on the Osmond type, we can do it the, the same. And you can actually, in the spreadsheet, uh, sorry, in the files that I send you, there's a spreadsheet that has the same data. Uh -huh. Plot, uh, ready to be plotted either in Drossholt or in Osmond uh, 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 isochrons. In Osmond isochrons, from the intersection to zero, we can get the isotopic composition of the autogenic, uh, autogenic phase. For example, from these, to the, from these isochrons, we can actually get the isotopic composition 230-234 against 234-230, uh, and using this equation or this uh, in uh, this graphic, we can actually cal uh, calculate the age. So, the whole idea is to actually know 230, 232 of the of the detrital material that is being incorporated into our uh, sample. Mm -hmm. And there are three main ways to actually do this. Mm -hmm. One of them is assume a composition. The other is calculate using an isochron, and the other one is measured independently and correctly. So we're going to be discussing these three methods very, uh, very quickly. Again, these are two uh, mixed lines, assuming that we have an autogenic and a DRT part. And basically, uh, the whole idea is that if we assume that the thorium 230 that we're measuring in the sample is the thorium 230 radiogenic and the detrital, we can, uh, and knowing the isotopic composition of the detrital phase, we can actually calculate the thorium 230 in the detrital phase and then actually subtract it from, uh, from the measure to, uh, uh, 230 in, uh, in the sample. The first way to do it is actually uh, assume it, mm -hmm. and again, kind of lovely. I uh, started with this method, which is basically, let's say, okay, I don't know, I don't know the isotope composition uh, of the detrital material, but I know that this has been measured at the Earth. Mm -hmm. So we know the elemental composition of the Earth. Mm -hmm. There are people working on the elemental composition uh, of the Earth, and the elemental composition of the Earth crust has been. Uh, um, Ross Taylor and Thor McLean worked a lot in the, the 1980s, and they actually determined that the thorium 238 to 32, sorry, this is 238 to uranium, is uh, uh, for the for the crust. The average composition is 3.8 plus or minus two. Mm -hmm. So it's a large. So, so, can, what, so what can I said, okay, 
we can assume that the differential composition is very likely to fall within these limits of uranium and thorium uh, ratios. And we can assume that it is at uh, secular equilibrium or very close to secular equilibrium. So we can assume that it's going to have this isotope, uranium isotope composition, uh, uh, not isotope composition, um, activity ratios of 1 plus or minus 0.1, plus or minus 1%, which is reasonably, uh, which is quite large actually. And a 40 to 30 to 38, also very close or at secular equilibrium. And this is the main assumption that, we're, uh, that, that they are doing. So, applying a little bit of maths with this, we can actually know the isotope composition, the 30 to 30 to 32 of the detrital material, of the uh, if, it, if it has the average composition of the crust. And also in this pre-check, there's one, uh, sorry, in the files, there's a, uh, an Excel file with a very quick uh, calculation of how to get this number. So you can get a whole, uh, a whole. So that basically means that 230, 232 detrital has this isotopic, uh, this activity uh, solution. So we go back to isoplot, and we are going to calculate the edges, and now we're, uh, I'm telling him, assume uh, initial uh, isotope composition, and I'm showing this isotope composition, mm -hmm. and boom, propagate the, 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 the uncertainties. This is very important, always click on propagate external uncertainties. And these are the corrected, uh, the uncorrected edges versus the correct, uh, corrected edges. As you can see, the edges, uh, the uncorrected edges are a little bit older than the corrected uh, edges. Sometimes uh, the correction might be a little bit uh, too small. Sometimes it's just a few years. Sometimes it's 15 years. Sometimes it could be uh, 100 years. Sometimes it could be, uh, for example, in this case, it's about 70 years, something like that. Uh, the important thing is that the corrected edges are younger. Why? Because we have subtracted the uh, the, the tractal thorium. Mm -hmm. There are two things. The corrected edges are younger because of that. But they also have larger uncertainties. And why is that? If we have a two-point isochron, and this is our sample, with this, uh, this is what we are measuring. And this is the, uh, the average composition of the air crust, and this is a big circle. Uh -huh. Basically, when we are projecting our, uh, the composition Towards the detritus, detritus free fraction, this is zero, this is actually this is zero. It's zero in this in this axis basically means that there is no thorium there. Basically, the uncertainty has to be uh, is is actually larger. Why? Because we have a large correction. The uncertainties in our in the, in the detritus material are uh, large. So th this is what is called a two-point isochron, sorry. Because we have one point, two points, and boom, we have a different correction. So this is really a two-point isochron. This is the simplest way to actually correct our, uh, our edges. And it works really nice uh, with samples sample with low thorium-232, or very large uh, thorium-238-232, or very low thorium-238-38 ratio. Probably 95% of the records that uh, you'll see published use this approach. Probably, I mean, yeah, sometimes probably even more. Some records probably shouldn't be corrected that way, but anyway. But it basically works like a charm. It's a really, really nice correction. It, is, it works until it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And when it doesn't work, when the desktop composition of the detrital material is outside uh, is outside the circle, which is either not within the composition of the, uh, the average composition of the air crust, not in secular equilibrium. Um, uh, yeah, basically, uh, that, that's what, uh, that is what, when it's here. And this is when we're starting to run into more tricky situations. How do we deal with this? Mm -hmm. We actually calculated using either isochrons or measured independently and correctly. So if we measure it independently and correct it, and Catherine mentioned some examples, we can do it either doing leaching experiments of the soil, 
doing cave monitoring and see uh, and measure the thorium composition uh, in, in the Greek water, um, the bedrock analysis, and then in isoplot, we actually can put this the all the composition of the, the of the detrital material, and actually the way it works is now this is not working, but we have a very precise characterization of the detrital composition. And because it's very precise, what used to be something like this is now a more correct. Uh, it, it, it'll provide a more correct uh, composition, uh, a more correct composition with a significantly better uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And that uh, and that basically has the advantage because uh, if the correction of the trital material is quite significant, if the age corrections that we are obtaining in the contribution of the trital thorium are significant, that basically means that if we want to obtain good uncertainties in our ages, we have to work in characterizing the, uh, the trital image. So I'm going to show you an example. Uh, this is from two, this part two, 2007, published in Nature, and uh, Caroline, 2012, published in Science. Uh, these are stalagmites from Borneo, mm -hmm. which were really uh, they, they were dated in Caltech. Uh, I mean, when you look at the, the details of this work, it was really a pain to actually date uh, date them. But they actually made a very nice job in dating this this stalagmite. Why there were a problem? Um, basically, ah, as uh, as Kathleen uh, said, and I cannot stress it, uh, enough. Always look at the supplemental material because there's always very interesting uh, information about the data. These stalagmites have three problems, uh -huh. and this, these are problems which are not uncommon actually. Very lo uh, low uranium concentrations, which are not different to many other parts, uh, many other stalagmites. Uh, they have around 50 ppb of uranium, up to 100 ppb of uranium, up to 1.5 ppm. Uh, ppm. But they have very low uranium-234. Because they have very low uranium-234, the production of thorium-230 uh, radiogenic is actually uh, a lot, uh, is very, it's, it's actually depressed. Uh, it's, it's actually very low. And they have high thorium-232, which basically means that there's a lot of uh, thorium-230, uh, there's an incorporation of thorium-230. So basically, there's a significant bias on the in, on the ages in So how did they work? Basically, they uh, in some parts of the stalagmites they collect coeval aliquots from different parts of the stalagmite. Basically, means that for one of these bands they actually collected three or four samples uh, for uh, for each band. No, not for each band. For some bands, for some some sections of the stalagmites, like here and here and here. And I think some somewhere around here too. And Pertin actually plots isochron, uh, Russell type isochrons, while Caroline plots uh, um, Osmond type uh, two isochrons to actually calculate the uh, isotopic composition of the autogenic material. But this is the isotopic composition of the autogenic material here, here, and here. But this is not the isotopic composition of all the stalagmites. But what it actually did is with this composition, they can actually calculate the thorium-230, 232 for the detrital material. And they can actually see how different it is in different parts of the, of, of, of the stalagmites. So these are the Russell iso uh, isochrons. So what you're seeing here is the data from part team. And you don't see that this, uh, this isotope, these activity ratios are plotting in a, in a like a cross or like an oval, something like that. They actually look like a, like uh, like basically like a line. Basically, if you look at it very very carefully, you will see that these are very extremely long elongated ovals, like really 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 long ovals, and they are tilted. Mm -hmm. Basically, what I mentioned about the error correlations uh, earlier is because the uncertainty here in 238 to 232 is actually correlated with the uncertainty of 232 to 32. Why? Because the uncertainty uh, here, the uncertainty of 32 has to be reflected in both axes. 
So that basically means that the correlations, that the uncertainties here, uh, oh, shit, sorry. Sorry. so that basically means that the, uh, the uncertainties are, are, are correlated, and uh, it has to be considered for uh, for the statistics. I'm not going to go into the details. Uh -huh. But that's uh, one of the things that that, that, uh, that that has to be done. Um, yeah. So they actually calculated for uh, from, from the slopes here different uh, uh, compositions for the antigenic material and. In Caroli, 2012, and why I'm comparing this because they are from the same case. Uh -huh. uh, they are actually doing this exactly the same thing, but using Osmond uh, isotopes. You can find the data for these plots also in the, in the file that I, that I send you, and they cal actually calculate the data for the autogenic uh, autogenic phase, mm -hmm. and they try. So taking the data from Parti from some. Uh, that you can do it here. They actually <coughs> go to an isochron, the uncertainties levels, the output errors, uh -huh, and the correlation. We are going to be using what is called a maximum likelihood. It's a it's a one way to it's a form a robust form to actually consider the uncertainties uh, in the x and y uh, axis uh, for for a regression and. We call, uh, we're going to be calculating the Rosfeld uh, uh, isochronos, propagating external uncertainties. I'm not using the error correlations here. And this is how they actually, once you put it run, it takes like two seconds, and this is how we actually look at it. Mm -hmm. And I actually, this is cut. But anyway. And what they actually do is you, have a, a, you can calculate the composition of the antigenic material, or you can ask isoplot to calculate the composition of the detrital material. And you get the calculation of the detrital material. You can do the same thing for the Osmo isochrons. Look, they look completely different, same data set. But the stock composition is very similar. So it's two, way, two different ways to obtain exactly the same information. Why was this important? Why they have to go through all this effort? This is the summary of the iso of the 32-32-32 that they were uh, the atomic 232-32 that they were obtaining on different parts of the stalagmites. These are the, di the, the different values, different stalagmites, and this is the composition of the crust. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, actually, sorry, this value, uh, sorry, this value here is not correct. But this this value is actually uh, uh, correct. Oh no, sorry, this value is in ppm too. Yeah, so yeah, as you can see, the isotope composition of the detrital thorium is very different from the uh, from what they, you can obtain from the cross. And this why they go through the uh, through all the effort? Well, basically because they made all the trip to Romeo and they only had one chance. But also because uh, they uh, with no, knowing this isotopic composition they can actually obtain more precise ages than using the composition of the crust. Okay. So for the lessons they learned, basically that thorium-230, 232 can be and is uh, usually different from the crust. And when you have uh, 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 a stomach might be large uh, concentration of thorium, this becomes very significant, very, very important. There's a problem with 2D isochrons, and one of them is that they are not completely independent from, from each other. Uh -huh. 230, for example, this type of isochrons, 234, uh, 230 depends on 234, and 234 is actually in these two axes, so they are, they are correlated in a complex way, they are not completely independent. Uh -huh. Also here, they are cor uh, correlated. So the data points are not completely fully independent. So one dependent on each other, but actually they are treated as, as independent. So that's not completely correct. So what can Ludwig 
came uh, in 1994. Uh, it basically, this is the normal evolution um, plot that, uh, that you have. So basically said, okay, this is the edge of my sample. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, this is the default of free composition. So basically he said, okay, this is the composition. I'm gonna add another axis. And this axis is 232, 238. Like in a nose mode, uh, uh, isochrome. And this 232, 238, it's gonna, my the detrital composition is somewhere around here, above this, uh, uh, above this space, uh, above this plane, sorry. This is zero, so the, this is the detrital free, and the higher you go, the more detrital material it So this is the autogenic composition, the detrital free composition, this is the detrital composition, and if you have coital samples, they will form, and again, a mixing line mm -hmm. between these two phases. And then it's just a matter of getting a regression, uh, you know, a three-dimensional regression. In reality, what we have is three different, uh, uh, we have the coeval samples, uh -huh, and we can project that to get the composition of the detrital, uh, of the detrital free sample, where basically where 238, 230, uh, 232, 238 is equal to zero. And no, uh, with the idea that the uh, the trital composition will be somewhere over here, over here, over here, or over uh, out, out of scale. The maths to do that can get actually quite complex, because now you're, uh, you're doing a regression considering the uncertainties in three, uh, in three di dimensions, so the maths can be complex, uh, very complex algebra. Lucky for you, lucky for me, lucky for all of us, you don't have to do it. You rarely find this, uh, this approach followed uh, in solid mites. Why? Because you have to get a lot of samples, it's complex, it's expensive, uh, not, uh, not, very com uh, not very common to find it in, uh, for, for solid mites. So I found this paper uh, by Durand, they're dating uh, pedogenic culprits, very similar to what we're, uh, we do. Uh, they have highly variable compositions of, of uranium and thorium in the threat of material. And you can see these plots, like really, how these plots really, uh, really nicely in a 3D space. Mm -hmm. These plots are actually quite difficult uh, um, to make. Uh -huh. But they, they, they plot really, really, really nice. This is the composition of uh, in secular ethereum. So you can see that some samples of the detrital material is definitely not plotting uh, in within the fields of secular ethereum. Can you do that in isoplot? Yes, you can do that in isoplot. This is data from, from this paper that you can also find uh, in, the, uh, in, in, in the folder. Mm -hmm. You just go to, to, uh, go to evolution. But then you say calculate an isochrome age and propagate its technological uncertainties. And boom, this is what you have. What is it? What kind of plot is this? This is the evolution diagram. These are the measured samples that are being just, imagine that you are, that you are just looking at this in 3D and these are above this. This is the isochrome. And this is the inter isochrome uh, intercept. So this sample, so this is actually projecting into this uh, in, in, into this area, and this is actually giving us the isotopic composition of the detritus free sample, mm -hmm. and actually giving us an age. Mm -hmm. So, what do you know uh, now? We know that all carbonate samples are dirty, all of them. Mm -hmm. All stalagmites will have some degree of thorium two thirty two. There is no way, if you have uh, uh, thorium-232 uh, introduced in your sample, basically means that you also introduce some part of, uh, at least a tiny part of the uranium or thorium-230. Mm -hmm. A two-point isochrome will work, work great in most cases, particularly if you have low thorium-232. Uh -huh. uh, if that's not the case, <coughs> You have to do an isochrome. What most people actually do is 
um, that, that I've worked with, if their samples have a lot of thorium, they get up. Oh, why bother? They just discuss. Um, I'm not like that. I, uh, I like geochronolog the geochronolog uh challenges, so that's what I uh, recommend also working with the isochron uh, corrections and get uh, and getting into it. Mm -hmm. So now you have to build an H model. You do that, how you do that? Uh, an H model, a mathematical function that assigns an H to each sample based on their measured distance, either from the base or the tip of the standard. And this is very important because uh, basically this is the most, this is why you are dating samples. This is because you, uh, this is the most important part of uh, the, the, the combination of the date of, of your dating. Mm -hmm. This is an H model. Uh, th these are uh, sorry. No, no, this is not an H model. This is just a plot of distance against H, corrected H. Uh -huh. An H model is basically uh, an equation that will an equation on a form that will give us an, a, a relationship between distance from the tip of depth and its corresponding H. Uh -huh. And each model should be monotonic, basically means that has to grow, has to increase with age, age has to increase with depth. Uh -huh. And the other important thing is that not single point is independent. Even for that, you, you dated this independently. They are not completely independent because, well, you know, growth rates do not don't vary like, uh, like quite significant. They are not very variable in satellites. So they're, I mean, they ha they're kind of related. So the other thing is you spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours micro drilling your stalagmite, doing laser ablation or whatever, but you have hundreds if not thousands of points you have to assign an age. But you only have a limited amount of, of, of dated positions. So what do you do? You have an inversion. A linear interpolation, it works, it works fine. Uh -huh. Uh, sometimes it, it's done. Uh, these in, this inversions are, what do you do with them? And then we spend a lot of time working with the uncertainties and, and minimizing the uncertainty of, of, the, of the contribution of the tractor material. And then suddenly, are we going to ignore that? We cannot ignore it. We have to take it into consideration. Mm -hmm. A linear regression looks nice, a polynomial equation looks nicer, but still it's not fitting perfectly. So there are two options to work with. One of them works with R, which is Stalage, and the other one works with MATLAB, which is Copra. Mm -hmm. Basically, they are considered all the age uncertainties, and they actually see how are these translated into the time, into the time series. Mm -hmm. And they can handle the presence of hiatus, and they actually use uh, an objective method to actually detect whether there's an age inversion or if there's a, or there's a problem with, uh, with, with the dating, it should it stay or should they go. The stalage, I was going to show you how to run it, but we're running out of time. So basically it requires two, uh, two files, one of them with the age and the depth of the samples, and the other one with the depth of the, sam uh, how, how many of the sample props. Builds a preliminary H, H model. Basically, it tells you, tries to detect uh, whether you have major or minor outliers. Uh, fit line between uh, the points. Uh, makes an, uh, what it's called a Monte Carlo simulation. Basically, I'll show you in a second. Basically, makes a lot of simulations. A lot uh, assesses all the possible lines that can fit within the uncertainties. Uh -huh. And then goes and it starts growing. And I'll show you in a second how does it look like. So this is in R. So it's actually running. Oh, come on. Yeah, OK. So it starts running. And this is the H model. Uh, it starts uh, working with, uh, uh, with the H model. Uh, the only problem that has Stalage is that it only runs on old versions of R. Doesn't work only with R on the, on the uh, with the graphical interface. It runs on version 2.1, I think. 
But other than that, it works really, really nicely. And these are all the iterations that are that is, that, that is actually doing to actually calculate. And this is your H model, basically what what is happening. What do you get? You get a text file with a next y plus uh, a y plus and y minus the consecutive sample number, the depth uh, of uh, of your proxy sample, the median age for that f, the maximum age, the minimum age. And you can then have an H model. This is really an H model because it's actually giving you an H for each, an H and an uncertainty for each sample point of your proxy. On the other hand, Copra, uh -huh, uh, you can get Copra from here. Copra also works, uh, has a little bit of a problem that works on early versions of MATLAB 2014. People have told me that works also on modern versions, but not the graphical interface, I think. I've only managed to run it in this version of, uh, of MATLAB. Uh -huh. And basically, Copra has a multi uh, uh, has this um, multi color approximation that it calculates all the possible routes uh, and then uh, based on the uncertainties that we are providing to, 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 the, H, uh, to, to the system. And it actually translates these uncertainties to the time series and to the actually uh, uh, the proxy. The other advantage that Copra has over SLH is it actually allows inclusion of layer counting. So if you have layer counting because you spent several hours counting layers on your 800 years uh, stalagmite, you can actually include this in the H model. Or if you have layer counting by band counting uh, because of trans strontium variability, uh -huh. you can also include this in, in the H model. Uh -huh. So this is how we actually Copra works lo uh, looks like. And I'm going to run this. Uh -huh. It doesn't seem like it's doing anything because when I was doing the screen capture, it's not capturing the other uh, windows that are uh, showing up. But this is I'm loading here a text file with the, with the data, a text file with the proxy de uh, details. Here, the main difference is that I'm, uh, I'm um, including the, a, uh, the depth of the sample and the value of the, uh, of the, of the, uh, of the proxy. This, uh, it plots an, an initial uh, H mo uh, model. I remove one H inversion, and it actually calculates all, this is all the possible solutions that calculates. It's actually calculating 2,000 solutions uh, uh, for that H model and how these uncertainties are actually translating into the uh, into your time series. Whether you like it or not, uh, I mean, whether you like it or not, it's, uh, it's up for, the, for discussion because it is actually introducing more variability than the actually observed into the, into the time series. It really depends on you to decide how to do it. This is what you get from Copra. Plot, uh -huh. You can get plots in JPEG format and also uh, the maximum age, medium age, and how the proxy is actually uh, <coughs> being affected. A comparison with same data set between, uh, with, between installation and Copra, oh, they look fairly similar. You say, yeah, it's exactly, exactly the same. Once you put them one on top of the other, say, yeah, exactly the same, it doesn't really matter. There's actually, at least for this data set, a little bit of difference. I'm plotting here the difference between uh, the H difference between Copra and, and SLH. There appears to be a systematic difference uh, in Copra. Uh, it's something that, at least, is happening with this data set. It's something that has to be assessed, fully assessed with, uh, with whatever you, uh, you're working. And there are some border, border effects. Basically, here, uh, Copra is actually putting in the line here. and. Uh, Salish is actually going uh, straight. There are some of changes here uh, that has to be worked uh, on. Pretty nice spot. But basically, just to wrap it up on the, on the H models, your whole record, whether it's a trace element, whether it's whatever you like, your whole record hinges on the robustness of the H model. So it's something that you have to really, really work really and understand really well what you're doing. It's very, 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 very important to assess whether the uncertainties are affecting your 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 conclusions or not. Uh, you're going to be asking, OK, what software is better to make an, a, a, an H model? 
it really doesn't um, matter because if your conclusions are based on using COPRA, or using SLH, or using a linear interpolation, they are not really robust conclusions. If your conclusions are based on the software that you're using, if your paleoclimatic conclusions are based on that, uh -huh, then they're wrong. They're not really robust. You have to find a way to make it more robust. And that's something that's very, very clear. The other very important very, uh, uh, thing is something that Sebastian Breitenbach put in his paper, says, the use of these data samples and their geochemical behavior, the mineralogical and petrographic environment should be evaluated by the specialist. Information on sampling depth, possible contamination, hiatuses, geochemical alterations might be available and can greatly help identify outliers prior to modeling. So it's very important, you have to put everything that you see in the start might you have to consider it further uh -huh, before uh, jumping into the wrong conclusions. So just to finish up, who's going to go to a uranium thorium dating lab soon or later? Some of you might go, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what to know, what to expect. It's not cheap. Mm -hmm. It's about $300 per sample. Uh, or even more. So you better make your time and resources best, get the best, most value. So if you have uh, uranium and thorium uran uh, concentration of your sample prior to send, to send it to, to the lab, it's better. Why? Because he'll tell you what to expect. If you have no uranium and lots of thorium, then might as well get some other sample. You don't want to spend $500 to tell you, so someone tells you your samples are undateable. Mm -hmm. Uh, get digital images of your of your stalagmites. Uh -huh. High resolution and with scale. This is very very important to know whether there's some petrographic information there. That there's some porosity or something like that, so you can uh, later discuss. Very important. Make sure that your samples arrive before you, or at least with you to the lab. Uh huh. When you're doing uranium thorium dating, it basically means that you have to be very 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 consistent on what you do. All the samples are treated exactly the same. So you know that the tiny difference that you can see are actually because the samples are slightly different, not because you did things slightly different. So you have to be extremely consistent in everything you do in your lab. Yes, you will be working with radioactive material. And that basically means that there's, uh, you, you'll be exposed to radiation, but it's tiny, extremely, extremely, extremely tiny. You'll get more radiation by eating a banana, and I'm serious, than by working in, in a uranium series lab. Mm -hmm. Unless, of course, you decide to eat your samples. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. But nevertheless, so the lab manager or someone in the lab will have worked uh, on developing the safety protocols, stick to them, do not improvise. You will be also working with uh, acids, bases, and peroxides, always you wear uh, in your protective clothes. Uh -huh. You will be working with an ultra-sensitive gravimetric method, isotope dilution. So never, ever, ever touch your sample without gloves. Ever. Mm -hmm. Write everything, label everything. That's very, very basic, very important. You need to be focused on your samples. So we usually say students that tell students that are coming to the clay lab just to forget about life. <laughs> Enjoy the cleaner. Mm -hmm. Relax, put some music. Very important. Manage your caffeine intake. <laughs> and I'm serious. Why? Because you will be pipetting into different uh, into your into different columns. And if you take five cups of coffee prior to your lab work, you'll be like <laughs> <laughs> so, and I'm talking about experience from experience, so yes, manage. And uh, finally working with the mass spectrometer. I don't know for you, but for me, first time, first time working with uh, Neptune, mass spectrometer was daunting. It was just like, shoes, this is huge. Uh -huh. uh, the instrument will not bite. The instrument will not explode. Uh -huh. But stick to the protocols that are secret to each lab. Uh -huh. Each lab, and you might have experience working in Larry Edwards lab. The protocol will be different if you're working with high chain, and the protocol will be different if you work in my lab and the protocols will be different if you're working in Germany and everything. Why? Because each instrument has slight differences and you better stick to, the, uh, to those protocols. There's a long work behind uh, uh, sampling those uh, 
Incredible. And yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much for such an interesting and comprehensive lecture. Unfortunately, we don't have time for the questions now, but I invite everyone to ask and discuss later during the yes, session. session. And leave the floor to uh, Ben, who will introduce our next speaker. Thank you so much. Sir, you're going to be using Dr. Sharon. Oh, there he is. <laughs>